a certificate for your participation in this webinar. We are happy to provide you with a certificate to verify your one hour of participation in the webinar. And if you want that, please email calpro at AIR.org to request that certificate. And now for the great opportunity to introduce my colleague, Ms. Brigitte Marshall, who is now the director at SEEDS, and she's the director of school services for them. And she's going to tell us a little bit about that as she starts. But many of you might know her from her work in adult education, working as the director of Oakland Adult Education Program. She's also served in a variety of leadership capacities in education and throughout the state representing adult education as well. She's going to be presenting today on a topic that she is considered extremely knowledgeable and an expert in, and it's called interest-based decision-making. And one of her previous leadership roles, she was in charge of an entire human resources department for very large school district in California and one of the ways in which she was able to get some so many wonderful things done is through her approach and using the strategy of interest-based decision. So I'm going to turn it over to Brigitte with this topic she'll be sharing with us today and Brigitte I'm going to let you take it away from here. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> oh dear, it's not good to start with a catch in the throat. Hope that isn't a sign of things to come. I'm just waiting for my slides to light up. There we are. Thank you, Cherise, for the nice introduction. As she indicated, I am the director of school services for SEEDS, which is a nonprofit organization based out of Berkeley. We provide services all over the Greater Bay Area. SEEDS stands for Services That Encourage Effective Dialogue and Solutions. And our background and history is in mediation and conflict resolution. And the Department of School Services is focused on building the relational capacity of school systems throughout California, which means that we do a lot of work supporting effective communication strategies, interactive, facilitative leadership skills. And we do a lot of work in restorative practices. Our focus is on positioning adult educators, excuse me, positioning educators to do their best work in service of their students. And it's in that capacity that I'm delighted to return to a focus on adult education. And I have this opportunity to chat with all of you wonderful adult education professionals this afternoon. So, I'm going to share some ideas with you. I do not consider myself an expert, I do have a number of different things that I think you'll find it interesting to think about in the context of interest-based decision-making. I want us to start in a little while with some definitions, just so that we have some shared understandings. But before we do that, let me ask you a question. What comes up for you when you think about solving problems and making complex decisions that will impact different stakeholders. Let's just spend a couple of minutes pondering that. And go ahead and type in some ideas. Could be one or two words simply. What comes up for you? What do you think and feel when you think about some of the really complicated decisions that you are confronted with right now? Ah, yes, the inclusion of stakeholders, absolutely critical. Yeah, you've got to recognize their voices in the process. Oh, yeah, how do you find the best solution without disappointing too many people? You can't please everybody, right? Yes, recognizing who's going to be in support and who you anticipate will be resistant. Yeah, I see calling out the importance of relationships, recognizing the barriers. Joint decision making. Yeah, what might this do to people's motivation? Absolutely. There are some um, very central themes that you are all naming. And some of the things that folks end up feeling about decision making 
represented in a comical way in this little cartoon here, recognizing that the more people you involve, the longer it's going to take, the more complicated it's going to be, right? And a lot of people during the course of complex decision making end up feeling some of these things indicated on the signposts. Complex decision making can be extremely overwhelming. And often the anxiety and the sense of overwhelm that people feel can direct people toward expedient or fast and what feels like efficient decision making in an effort to just get it done because of that sense of if we engage in some of these more time consuming practices, it's going to get more complicated, it's going to get messier, and in the end it's going to be harder. But I'm going to offer up some suggestions to you that you're probably already aware of in terms of balancing expedience with effectiveness in the long run. But before we get into some of the issues, let's take a look at some definitions so that we have a shared frame of reference for some of the things we're going to be talking about. And some of these things may feel very obvious. But it's important to have some clarity about how I'm going to use the terms in the context of this afternoon's conversation. Problems, pretty obvious, right? Matters or situations regarded as unwelcome or harmful and needing to be dealt with in some way. Often we don't register the harmful or unwelcomeness of problems, but that's essentially what they are. They are a challenge, they're a barrier, they're an issue that we're going to need to address in some way. And this is a really important one. Positions. Positions are situations and conditions, especially with relation to favorable or unfavorable circumstances. People hold positions on issues, right? You can have a position on the suggestion that a dog park is going to be built at the end of your street. You can be for it, you can be against it, and there are nuances. Your position is that it's a good idea as long as there are guidelines in place to limit barking, for example. Solutions, also pretty straightforward. It's an answer. And here's another important one. Interests. Interests are things that concern, involve, impact, and draw the attention of a person. And it's the relationship between interests and positions that we're going to explore in just a minute. And of course the final one, a decision, is a conclusion or a resolution. And it looks like that's been cut off just a little bit there, unfortunately. But the most important segment of that definition is that a decision is a conclusion or a resolution that is reached after consideration. And that's not often a part of the definition of decision that is remembered or called out, but I want to particularly call it out for us today. A decision is something that is reached after consideration. So, another question. What's special about interest-based decision making? Here's what I would suggest. When we make a decision, we're reaching a conclusion, of, as we've said by looking at the definitions, right? We're identifying a solution to a problem after considering the relevant positions or situations and conditions that are in play. When we engage in interest-based decision-making, here's what's happening. We're considering the positions that are in play. We make an intentional detour before we move to the solutions, and that detour has us considering the interests of the various stakeholders in a situation. And what's critical is that we do that before we land on any kind of solution. And if we don't, our decision may be at risk of being unsustainable, which is the best possible outcome. And it's vulnerable to being undermined actively by those whose interests haven't been considered in the worst possible scenario. And I have a framework that I think is helpful in making this clear. I call it the what's really going on iceberg. And this 
indicates the relationship between positions and solutions. Our inclination, once we've identified people's positions, is to immediately jump to solutions. And I'm asking us not to do that, but instead to take that detour, to get down underneath the surface, and to find out what people's interests or needs are. And only then, when we've done that, should we move to a solution. And some examples are experiences, values, beliefs, and intentions. Our interests and our needs come from our past experiences, the way we've been socialized, our culture, our religion. Our feelings, most often feelings of fear and shame, are what explain our interests and our needs. The things that we tend to display to people are the positions. I have this particular position on this issue or this problem. It's often very difficult for people to be clear and honest and open about their interests and needs because they're very personal. And that's what one of the things that makes it challenging for someone who is charged with making a complex decision because the work of figuring out what people's interests are is complicated and you're venturing into the realm of the personal. Uh, Burr is noting that this is a similar concept in human-centered design. Right on, absolutely, yes. Um, I just want to make a point about when it makes sense to make this detour. Taking the time to figure out what's really going on definitely adds time and complexity to your decision-making process. Decisions that can be made quickly should be made quickly. If there's a range of options from which a workable solution can be selected, and expedience is important, if it's really important to get this done, and that's more important than anything else, then taking an either-or approach in which there may be winners and losers can be very appropriate. Interest-based decision-making isn't right in every situation. But when the problem is complex and there are many competing interests, taking a both-and approach that seeks to find an inclusive solution that considers all the interests in play may be the better option. It's indicated, this approach is indicated, when durability and sustainability are more compelling than decision-making speed. So let's have a look now at the two different problem-solving approaches that I've just referenced, either or, both and. And I've listed on the le left-hand side of this table various different aspects of problem-solving and then contrasted the either or and the both and approach and recognizing that there is a, a cost, there's a, there are a set of outcomes when you make an either-or decision, and it's part of your consideration. How am I going to make this decision? If I make it in this particular way, these are going to be some of the outcomes. And it can be very appropriate. As we've said, if it's a question of getting it done, then you're going to go either-or. If you are looking at a really super complex situation and you know that the success of your decision in part rests on the support of the individuals who are going to be impacted by the decision, it's obviously going to be in your best interests and the success of the outcome's best interests to engage people to pursue strategies that are going to be collaborative. I'd also like to point out under the when to use it row, under both and, it points out that when the decision is high stakes, and that's something we often don't think about, the higher the stakes, the more likely it is that you're going to want to engage interest-based decision-making, as messy and complicated and time-consuming as it is, given the fact that the stakes are so high, it's not something 
that you want to take shortcuts about. Additionally, and I want to share another framework that I think is very useful with you, we know that people generally respond better and are more engaged in the outcome of a decision when those with decision-making power do things with them rather than for them or to them. This is illustrated by a framework called the Social Discipline Window. It was developed by Ted Wachtel at the International Institute for Restorative Practices, and it informs a very great deal of the work that I do in my role as Director of School Services for SEEDS. Essentially, there are four quadrants. This quadrant, which we sometimes call the two quadrant, indicates a situation where there is very high control, very intense rules and regulations and structures that are imposed, and not necessarily a very great deal of support or warm and fuzzies or nurturing or encouragement. It's much more a situation of, this is what needs to happen, get it done. And you can imagine how people feel when they are encountering that kind of decision making. In this quadrant, there may be less control, fewer guidelines, less structure, and a very great deal of support, of encouragement, of nurturing, of excusing, making allowances. This quadrant we call the four or permissive paternalistic quadrant because people are supported, but there's very little structure or guidance about what needs to happen. So a lot of making it up as we go along can happen when we're operating in this kind of way. And the not quadrant indicates a situation where there is very little guidance and very little support. That tends to be typically pretty chaotic and not a whole lot occurs. Our aspiration is to operate in the top right-hand quadrant where there are lots of guidelines, lots of structures, lots of information, lots of detail, lots of parameters, and a very great deal of support, opportunities for engagement, opportunities for participation, discussion, and consideration of everything that is going to impact us. So, that's where we want to be. We want to be operating in a situation of with. And if anyone has questions as we're going along, please, please feel free to type them in and I will try to respond. So in a situation where we take the time to identify and consider the interests of all those who are impacted by a decision, we will be best positioned for a collaborative engagement. And we already know that people respond best when those with decision-making authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. And here is another structure that I found really helpful. And it represents the relationship between various different interests. In this particular structure, the relationship is between my interests and those of others but it could be interests of some and interests of others. And again, we have these quadrants and we also have a middle ground. This quadrant indicates I am giving very little consideration to my interests, a lot of consideration to others' interests. So we call that conceding. I am not giving due regard to my own interests. I am perhaps trying to keep the peace by holding others' interests as more important, more valuable than my own. On the other hand, if I want to put my interests first and foremost, and I'm not going to pay much attention to others, I'm competing. I want it my way. And similar to the social discipline window, if I'm not really taking into account interests at all, I characterize that as copping out. It's really no way at all. And this is often what people think we're aspiring to in decision making, compromising. It's halfway. I'll give up a little bit if you give up a little bit. I'll give a little bit if you give a little bit. 
It's not actually the preferred way of doing things. What we're aspiring to is collaboration, where we are giving a high regard of interest, of importance to interests across the spectrum. So in this case, I'm thinking about my interests, and I'm also giving due regard to other people's interests. And when we can look at ways of considering those, we are well positioned for collaboration. So let's move on and just recap a little bit. We're going to take the interest discovery detour because, as we've said, complex challenges require thoughtful problem solving. We're not going to go directly from positions to solutions. We're going to take that detour under the surface and we're going to discover what people's interests are when the problems we're confronting are complex. Because we've considered sustainability and durability as compared to expedience and we're prepared to take the longer journey recognizing that in doing so we're going to have a more durable outcome. Because we know, as we've seen, as demonstrated in the social discipline window, that people are more committed to outcomes when collaboratively involved in decision making. And we know genuine collaboration requires identification and consideration of interests. So let's see. Let's have a look at the steps next. We know that in complex situations in which the investment and commitment of stakeholders is paramount, interest-based decision-making is a good idea. What does that mean? What are the steps in an interest-based decision-making process? On a very basic level, they look like this. Six steps. Find the problem. Identify who's in the mix. Figure out what's really going on for them under the surface. Identify the shared interests. And then you move into the steps five and six that are typical of decision making, develop options and craft a solution. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time thinking about steps five and six today because it's the earlier steps that are often neglected in traditional decision making. But um, let's just have a look at this. Step one, defining the problem. Has anybody ever encountered this phenomenon? You bring up an important concern, but I'm looking for a problem that better fits my preconceived solution. Very often, it is absolutely true that decision makers have already decided what it is they want to do. And they're looking for a way of describing a problem that meets what it is they've already decided they want to do. And when I encounter that kind of a situation in an education setting, it always makes me extremely concerned because I can be pretty sure that there has been very little work done to discover what interests are in play and how the real people who are going to be impacted by the decision are going to feel about what's happening. And uh, this very smart fella had this to say about the process of defining a problem. If he had 20 days to solve a problem, he'd take the first 19 to define it. Really can't overemphasize the importance of taking the time to do that work. So here are some guidelines for practically defining the problem. We want to create boundaries for problem solving. It's very easy for problem solving to go a little crazy and for descriptions and definitions of problems to become all inclusive. Um, we sometimes describe that as boiling the ocean. It gets so broad and non specific, it's a setup for failure. It's going to be very difficult for us to do any kind of solution identification because the definition of the problem is just too great. Um, I have found it very useful to start a problem definition with the phrase, how might we? We want to be careful that when we're describing the problem, we don't start leaning into 
solution identification. And it's very difficult to prevent ourselves from doing that. It's our natural inclination. Something else that often happens is that as we're defining the problem, we can't help ourselves from commenting or providing some commentary on why the problem exists, listing accusations, for example. And something else to bear in mind is the fact that a problem changes over time. A complex problem is dynamic. It's not going to stay static. There's going to be movement. So here's a general set of guidelines, and I think it's probably best understood in the context of an example. And uh, I hope everybody had the opportunity to print out and read the scenario from Apple's adult school. If you didn't, it is one of the attachment attachments that is listed under handouts in the bottom left corner. But let's just take a minute to look at this very complex scenario, which calls for some well-informed, thoughtful decision making. We have Apple's adult school. And let's see. Um, Apple's adult school is struggling to develop a portfolio of course offerings that is responsive to what adult learners say they want and also labor market demand. Not, necess not unnecessarily duplicative of course offerings already in place at other adult schools in the consortium and aligned with courses at the community college. The school has had a long-standing tradition as the hub of the community with many community interest classes and ESL classes that have been attended by the same students for years, many of them seniors, and they're engaged in classes as much for the benefit of social connection as anything else. Many faculty members at Apple's adult school are resistant to change the focus of instructional programming, and they've expressed skepticism about the school's ability to recruit teachers who can deliver more employment-oriented programming. They're emphasizing that this is not what students want anyway. And to add to the complexity, a new administrator at the school wants to professionalize the faculty and embed prep and planning and PLC time into the paid hours of instructors so that a focus on improved outcomes for adult learners can happen. Some people within the school community are very resistant to this direction because of the reduction in instructional hours and the number of adult learners who can be served in this model. Adult Education Consortium members have been stressing the need to develop regional relationships and partnerships that the old guard at the school doesn't trust that doing so will result in benefits for adult learners. They believe that their students will be lured into other competing programs. So, pretty complicated situation with many different stakeholders in play. So I'm going to ask you all to do some thinking and share some ideas. We need to define the problem. We need to craft an issue statement that we can use to represent a summary overview of what is confronting Apple's adult school. And let's take a look at the guidelines again. When we're defining the problem, here are some of the things that we want to do. You have, hopefully, your case study printed out. Let's take a minute or two to see what you can come up with in terms of a brief statement for the problem that is confronting Apple's adult school. And I know this is a challenging task, but often the spur of the moment off the top of your head responses to this kind of challenging situation are the absolute best ones. So do your best, couple of sentences, define the problem. How might we finish that phrase? There's a nice suggestion from Francisco. How might we include PLC time into our programs without interfering with student learning time? Yep, that really hones in on one aspect of the problem, it's a good description of part of the problem. I think there are other elements that we would want to include in our definition. 
see there are multiple folks typing. Ooh, nice. This is a very bird's eye view from Allison. How might we reduce the fear of change within the star? Yeah, that's a very um, all-inclusive description of what is confronting the school. Oh, nice. Carla is saying, how might we rewrite our school's vision and mission to clarify our shared goals? So using a vision and mission definition process to get at the fact that the landscape has shifted. Ooh. How might we increase student outcomes through teacher collaboration and shared decision making? Nice. So identifying student outcomes as the thing that is central to the challenge confronting Apple's adult school. How might we get the support from the staff with the changes that need to be made? Nice. So Leslie is really focusing in on what, what is being recognized running through that whole complex decision about support from the staff is going to be critical to this entire situation. How might we build partnerships that feel collaborative rather than competitive? Oh, very nice. So again, identifying that there's a central theme running through many of the issues confronting Apple's adult school. And Kim has chosen to characterize that as contrast between collaboration and competition. I can see that folks are continuing to grapple with this. How might we create value with regard to an emerging vision with our students and staff? Nice. So you all clearly have digested the central charge, and that is to get at the heart of the matter, right? And it's not as if there is one more, one absolutely correct way of defining this. So I'm going to share with you mine, and I don't want to imply that I think mine is better than any of yours. But um, for the purposes of using an example to move forward, here's what I have offered up for you. How might we develop a realistic portfolio of high demand aligned course offerings that are designed to prioritize rigorous adult learner outcomes. I'll just say a few words about why I chose some of those words. Uh, how might we develop a realistic portfolio of high demand aligned course offerings? So the word realistic is an umbrella word, I call them umbrella words, because it requires us to consider a number of the different factors that are in play. High demand requires us, it's another umbrella term, it requires us to consider the various different elements that are feeding into demand. There's adult learner demand, there's demand created by partners, there's demand created by the new funding structure and what can and should be funded, etc. So it requires consideration of an array of different things. And then uh, each of the words in the problem statement comes from an aspect or an element of the overall description of the challenge that is confronting Apple's adult school. So I hope that you will be comfortable in indulging me with that as the, the way we're defining the problem confronting Apple's adult school so that we can continue with our deliberations. The next step is step two, identify the stakeholders. And um, let's see. Let's see what we can do together as a group to just quickly brainstorm who all the different stakeholders might be in our situation. So quickly just throw out some groups of individuals that we know we're going to have to take into consideration. We've got students, adult learners, absolutely teachers. We've got partners, business partners, 
We've got other staff in the adult schools. We've got local boards. You might have to bear in mind what your school board has to say about it. We're differentiating between current students and potential students, consortium members, workforce investment boards, the community colleges who are in our consortiums, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think you've named all of the, the key individuals. I've listed those that you have called out there. And the next step, once we've identified the stakeholders, is to name their positions. And remember, we said that's the stance that they are taking with regard to a particular situation. For our example, let's take a look at some of the stakeholders and the positions that they're holding. So the administrator, we might characterize the new administrator at Apple's adult school as, as holding the position that quality is better than quantity. This administrator's position is that the school should offer fewer classes and more prep planning and professional development for teachers and focus on harder outcomes. That's the administrator's position. Some of the instructors at the school are holding the position that the school should prioritize service delivery that maximizes the number of classes available to adult learners. So for these instructors, their position is we should be offering the, the largest number of classes possible. For other instructors, their position is that the historical portfolio of course offerings should be prioritized above anything else, because that's what adult education is all about at its heart. That's their position. The adult education consortium programs, they have a position that says some programming should be eliminated if it's spreading the pool of adult learners too thin and is undermining the consortium's shared ability to demonstrate effectiveness. So that's a position. And I won't go through all of them, but I hope that, that, that it's clear that once we've identified the stakeholder, we have to summarize and characterize the position that they are taking with regard to the problem that we're confronting. When people hold positions that are at odds with each other is when we confront challenges, right? We know that we run the risk of decision making that compromises, competes, or concedes to one or more parties. If you go back to the framework that I shared with you about considering the interests of the various different parties, when we've got people whose positions are at odds with each other, we're at risk of leaning into one of those quadrants where we're conceding or we're competing or we're negotiating and compromising. And that means that there are going to be winners and losers. And that in turn means that we could be setting ourselves up for a final decision that might be actively undermined by some of the stakeholders at worst. And the best scenario might be that it's unsupported, which brings its sustainability and success into question. So, in order to engage with stakeholders appropriately, we need to do the work of identifying the interests, right? We need to get underneath the surface and figure out what is behind their positions. Then we can look for shared interests and prioritize and leverage those during decision making. So how do you do that? A very important factor to consider is the need to preserve relationships in the process. Because at the end of the day, we all still have to work together. And our ongoing ability to get it done in service of adult learners is what really matters. And that's why the winning-losing framework, the either-or, is not a good idea when the situation is complex and the outcome really relies on the buy-in of the stakeholders. When you've got winners and losers, you're setting yourself up to have disgruntled folks in the mix. So efforts to identify interests or needs have to be sensitively executed because we're interacting in a very personal and often high stakes terror. Interest identification can be achieved through thoughtful and sensitive inquiry using learning questions rather than 
critical questions. So let's take a quick look at what that looks like. I characterize this as judging versus learning questions to determine interests. Learning questions can be characterized as who, how, what, when, where questions as compared to why questions, which are often experienced by the listener as implying a judgment. Learning questions focus on understanding what people are thinking and feeling about a situation. Let's take one of our stakeholders as an example, the adult education instructor whose position supports the maximization of class offerings to adult learners. If you're charged with leading this inquiry, you might have a hypothesis or hunch about the interests or needs behind a particular position. Your questions can be informed by this hunch, but not blinded by it. You need to be inquisitive, genuinely curious about figuring out what's really going on for your stakeholders. So in a situation like this, and this is hard for educators, we have to be in learning mode, not teaching mode. Every situation is different and you're going to know your own people. But a well-crafted conversation with this particular educator, the adult education instructor who is hanging on to their position of maximizing class offerings to adult learners, I'm going to look in just a second at, at, at what inquiry with that particular individual might look like. But here on this slide, you can see some examples that contrast. And I, I hope that you can see that the why questions, if you think about how you might react to some of those questions, why don't you feel able to support a shift to outcomes focused programming? They feel judgmental, right? They're going to put people on the defensive. Rather than, as compared to these learning questions, that I hope feel inquisitive. What comes up for you when you think about outcomes focused program? The phrasing of the question is important, and also the fact that you're asking about people's feelings and emotions. That matters a lot to people that you're taking the time to find out. So here are examples. I'm not going to spend an enormous amount of time going over these because I have my eye on the clock and there's a few other things that I want to share with you. But you can see through how, what, who, what, what kinds of questions we are delving into what's going on with you, what's going on under the surface that is causing you to take this position. So in brief, that's the process that you're going to engage in. You're going to engage in curious inquiry with each of your stakeholders to find out what their interests are and to help you understand what's behind their position. And I've characterized some of these here and on the next slide. And let's see if we can. Here's, here's our adult education instructor who's holding the position that service delivery should be prioritized that maximizes the number of classes available to adult learners. Let's take a look at the interests that emerged when this individual was asked questions intended to reveal what's really going on. If fewer classes are offered, fewer instructors are needed, and I might lose my job. Now that may not be the only interest, but it is an interest, and it is part of what is informing the position. And we want to remember that as we're making our decision. Additionally, this educator is saying, I want to continue to serve adult learners who need accessible services. It's not all about them. There are some interests that relate to adult learners, for sure, in play also. And here are the other stakeholders with their respective positions and interests. And I'll give you just a second to review those. And I'm going to ask you our next question. As you're glancing at these very quickly and reviewing, I'm wondering if you are seeing an area of shared interests emerging. Is there something that all or most of the stakeholders have in common? And if you think you're seeing it, go ahead and type it in. How do you think it could be described? Throw some quick ideas out. 
serving adult students, Francisco says. At heart, yes, pretty much, right? Every single one of our stakeholders has expressed as an interest a commitment to adult learners. Tom is noting there's a lot of insecurity. Yeah, absolutely. And we're noting community engagement, wanting to be involved in growth and programs, inclusion. Yep, there are definitely some specific interests held by one particular stakeholder group that are not shared by anybody else. And there are also some interests that we feel like there's very significant overlap. So again, not to imply that I'm right and no one else is, but I'm going to share with you the example that I've provided of how we might describe the shared interests. We share an interest in ensuring that we are offering a high quality portfolio of course offerings that maximize the potential of adult learners in our community. And again, these words are chosen very carefully to reflect a variety of different interests that are sim similar and connected. We are offering a high quality portfolio of course offerings that maximize the potential of adult learners in our community. There were some pretty disparate perspectives on whether hard outcomes were required, employment focus, whether it should be community based programming. So language like high quality portfolio of course offerings that maximize the potential pulls on and highlights the essence, the spirit, the interests that all of these different stakeholders share. It's a, it's a unifying phrasing as opposed to a calling out the distinctions and the differences. Um, there's a number of different ways that you can go about mapping and identifying shared interests. The chart on the previous two slides is one way that you could do it. Um, and there's another way that I'm going to share with you here. It's essentially a Venn diagram, right? And you can do it in a very informal way to show that there are interests that are shared between a couple of stakeholders. For example, instructors and the administrator. You see the phrase, I may have to lay people off. That's an interest or a concern that the administrator has, and it intersects with the instructors who are concerned about possibly losing their jobs. So there's a shared interest there. It's not an interest that everybody shares, but there are intersections. So we've said that the statement of shared interests offers a unifying principle around which people can be gathered and activated. But it's also important to be mindful of the outlier interests that have been uncovered in the process that may be very specific to one particular stakeholder or group. And we've talked about the adult educator who's concerned about losing their job and livelihood, right? The adult learner who may no longer have access to classes that were keeping them connected to the community. So a thoughtful interest-based decision-making process will pay high regard and respect to these issues and not just discount them in service of the shared interests. So I really want to emphasize that. While we are looking to identify the shared interests, in interest-based decision-making, we also want to make sure that we're paying as much attention as we possibly can to the outlier interests that may be held by only one stakeholder or one group of stakeholders. Thoughtful decision-makers will look for opportunities to ensure that the stakeholders feel heard, and that their interests have been acknowledged and validated. And then demonstrating empathy is really critical. And that's where your inquisitive, curious questions come in. A decision maker can move through implementation with a much greater degree of success when she understands where people are coming from. This is really relational work, folks. So what's next? Let's say we've identified our unifying principle 
and that it has the potential to bring stakeholders together in service of crafting decisions and problem solving in a way that we hope most people can support. Let's say we've been thoughtful about also looking for some responses to some of the outlier interests. How do we decide how to move forward? That's the next step, and it's called step five. Develop options. I'm going to move through these pretty quickly because these are characteristic of traditional decision-making processes. There are lots of different ways to develop a slate of options. And here are a few that are tried and true. Uh, we know that it's a good idea to turn to experts, right? What do the leaders in the field have to say? What are they recommending? Always good to look at the research base, to review it. Is there a body of accepted wisdom that it makes sense to consult? And then look to others who've trodden the path before us. There's no need to reinvent the wheel, as we always say. Are the best practices that we can draw from? So now what we're doing is we're holding our awareness of the interests, both the shared interests that we've carefully defined and the individual interests that we're going to try and bear in mind as we're going through our decision-making process. And we're holding those while we are developing our slate of options. We might engage brainstorming, we might do some straw design, or um, coming up with an idea, trying it out, iterating. If it doesn't work, that's OK, sort of prototyping. Let's say we have a number of options defined. Then we're going to move to crafting our solution. And here are a, a set of reminders or guidelines that are essentially bringing us back to what we know. If it's a complex problem, there's going to be a complex solution. We want to bring as many of the options that we've identified in step five together. And that's how we're going to satisfy as many of the identified interests as possible. We're going to keep our shared interests at the heart of our problem solving. And then we're going to tack on or add on a detail that is responsive to one of the outlier interests to the greatest extent possible. So for example, as Apple's adult school is moving through reframing and reprogramming in response to the new funding reality and to the new partnerships, in the decision-making process, the decision-maker is aware that, that there are adult educators who are concerned about losing their jobs. So as part of the solution that is crafted, it may be prioritized that existing adult education instructors have first consideration on new employment opportunities that occur as a result of the new programming. They may or may not be qualified but it's a relational response that recognizes the interest and the concern that has been named. It is responsive and it will do much to nurture engagement and to reduce outright opposition. Just a couple more reminders before we finish. Make the matching visible. Whenever identifying solutions, map them back to the interests that have been defined so that people know their interests have been taken into consideration. As we've said, we're going to anchor the solution in the shared interests. And we need to identify dependency between the options. Let's recognize that if we do this, then we're also going to need to do that. We're going to focus on achieving the desired result rather than developing the perfect plan. Just because we said we're going to do it doesn't mean we have to do it. If things change, we need to be responsive. And the last big reminder is to communicate a lot all the time to all the stakeholders. I know we're at time. Here are our steps. That's pretty much it. Remember to spend your time in steps two, three, and four. You're all pretty proficient in steps five and six. I wish you the very best of luck. I'm sorry there wasn't time for questions, but here's how to reach me.
I'd be more than happy to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you so much, Brigitte. This was great. A lot of information, a lot to think about, but really the way in which we should work with each other to address problems. I hope everyone enjoyed this. Thank you for your time this afternoon. This is our last Administrators Forum webinar for the school year, but please be on the lookout with our CalPRO events calendar for the webinars that we'll have starting in the fall. Have a great day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Please remember to, uh, to complete the evaluation, which is at the bottom of the screen there. Have a good day.